Unsung legend, Mr. What you go by, man? I go by Tony Green, and then as soon as I made that famous, everybody was Tony Green. Then it was T Green, and everybody jumped on the T Green bandwagon, so I called T Money Green. And next, I'm going to go with my whole name, Edward Anthony Green, when they steal, because T Money, <laughs> somebody's already stealing the T Money, man. I, can't, I don't know what to do, man. Dig, well, well, welcome, man. Welcome to the basement. Yeah, I've been seeing y'all down here. This is the famous basement. I, you know, it looked the same. <laughs> We're just without all the people. <laughs> right. but, uh, yeah, there's been some good vibes coming down here. You've had some good players, man. I, I, so I had to make my make my day. Hey, we appreciate it. And, and also in the house with us, of course, Mr. Reggie Canty. It is his basement, by the way. So <laughs> right. you know he's going to be here. And who we also have who? Dr. Gail Suhu. <laughs> Dr. Gail Suhu, how you doing? I'm okay. That's good. <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> man, the first, man, I got so many things I want to ask you, you know, because I've been listening to your music and, and playing your songs and didn't even know I was doing it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so the first thing, though, was when did you start playing the bass, man? I started playing in 1969, bro. Wow. I'm going to Mumford, uh, well, I was just getting ready to, you know, start in Mumford, and um, uh, I went to a talent show. Well, they say the talent show was 6970, because that's the way it was listed. And then the band was uh, uh, Willie Wooten was on keyboard. You had uh, Gene Dunlap on drums. Earl Clue was on guitar. My, my one and only Reggie McBride was on bass. Hey. And... You know, in my house, my dad, my stepfather is a famous bass player. Will Austin is his name. And uh, I've been in the ba in our basement, man, we used to sit on the steps and watch Gloria Lynn, Sonny Stitt, uh, Esther Phillips, uh, you know, Earl Clue later on. They got, they got kind of helped him get his break by letting him sit in at Baker's all the time. And uh, I mean, just all of the big people, Marcus Belgraves, you know, all of those guys raised me like, you know, Harold McKinney, like, you know, they was all my uncles, you know. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, I liked bass, but bass didn't uh, mean nothing to me until I went to school and heard somebody, like, maybe a little older than me, just a little older, playing something, you know, and he was playing If I Was Your Woman, mm -hmm. and Don't Play That Song For Me, and I mean, I was like, man, I got to play bass. So my real father was in Vietnam at the time. And he used to call like every Saturday and ask me, you know, if I wanted something and then he would make my stepmother go out and get it for me, you know. And uh, I wanted a bass. And I know he was thinking like, damn, he playing bass because of his stepfather. <laughs> but that wasn't it, man. It was strictly that talent show that did it for me. Right. And, and I mean, I never, my family could never buy me a bass, never buy me an amp. I always borrowed a lot of little stuff and then I got my first little cheap bass from Federals, you know. And, um. Uh, and I kept getting kicked out of all the bands because I didn't have no amp or I didn't have my own bass. So I just started my own, total my own vibe and my own group too. I was like, I know how to not get kicked out. I'll start my own thing. <laughs> that's and then I'll just play the way I can play. Because you got some dynamite players. And with me playing upside down, my E string is on the bottom. I'm right-handed. Yeah, that's you know, great. I'm just all twisted up. So a lot of the stuff that I hear a lot of them guys do, I can't even imagine. It don't register in my head so when I hear them do the licks and a lot of them kind of sound the same doing their licks whereas mine is a lot different it come from crying and feeding the family and you know mm -hmm. really needing friends that you you know you ain't got no friends right now so I say well I know what to do and I just grabbed that bass and I uh, just gave it a shot who knows was the first song I learned by Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. and then bumping and then uh 
West Montgomery bumping, which was only one note through the whole thing, but we did a little party one time and played them two songs all night long. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, playing the bass, that was a talent show that got me, man. It wasn't even, it wasn't even my dad, who is like one of the fantastic ones. He's taught Carrie Lacey. He's taught a lot of uh, um, Marion Hayden. He's taught a lot of the bass players and worked with him. Even Ralph has done some stuff with my dad. You know, they come in and learn a little something and, you know, hit the road, you know? Wow, that's but, cool. Uh, yeah, that's how it happened for me on that. Okay, so so when you put your band together and all that kind of stuff, uh, who who's some of the cats that you first started playing with? Well, the, the, the cats I started playing with, I mean, they kind of ain't around now, but um, Corey Heath uh, was just a little drummer. I mean, I really just got nobodies. I mean, right. w we all were just straggles, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When nobody all dope and all hell of a, mm -hmm. and then it just, just the blend of that we end up doing good and we, we would do our own songs and we would do you know uh, other people we would do covers and put our own little twist on them but back then you gotta understand it was a bunch of local bands you know I come yeah. from the era when it was music in school right. and it was mm -hmm. local band I mean we played the stage one the Chantiki uh, the subway uh, Alpine I mean it was just so many different places you could play you know what I mean right. uh, Latin Quarter I mean, so now it's just nowhere for guys to play. I really feel bad about that too. I mean, it's just horrible. So, you know, you know, hopefully one day a, a club will come in here, like Purple Rain in that movie Purple Rain. That would be sweet. Cause, mm -hmm. you know, I think people should keep that that edge going, man. It ain't about trying to group up and have your little set of friends that you gonna have over here because there's a bunch of y'all might can't play, or something like that. But I think you should just embrace everybody. I mean, everybody's got their own story to tell, just like you always bringing that up. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's got their own, you know, tears that they playing on their instruments. So, you know, I, I just don't like the new vibe that everybody's doing. I like it the way it used to be. And, I mean, we would challenge each other and get up. And I, you know, you might be the guy down playing like I don't know what, or he beats you down and you just go home and practice a little more. It was mm -hmm. never nothing serious and want to fight. And, right. You know, now people want to hate you for the stuff that God made you do. I mean, I, I, I didn't have to know how to play. I mean, that God, I, I picked it up, I learned, and then I got breaks. I mean, that's not my fault. You know right. what I mean? I wasn't looking, I wasn't never like looking for breaks. It's just that the breaks came. <laughs> you know, and I was 17 years old when the dramatics came knocking on the door. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So, and uh, the year before that, my parents wouldn't let me go out of town with this group I was playing with called Deep Velvet. Uh, they they had a little local record that was good. I remember that. You remember them? I remember that. Yeah, but then um, a year after that, then Ryan Banks, you know, first he was going to use my whole band because his band, back then the band would go on strike. So they knew they had like about a month before they was going to do a West Coast tour. Mm -hmm. And the band was like, well, we're going to hold out. And so Ryan was like, well, T, can your band do it? And I said, yeah, but what happens is it, it takes you a lot longer teaching eight people a show as opposed to one person. Mm -hmm. So after it got down to like a couple weeks left, they was like, man, it ain't gonna work. We got all the other band members back, but we don't want the bass player, and we want you to do it. Can you do it? And I didn't want to quit my band, man. I was like, no, man, because we were a very powerful and working band. I mean, we worked a lot. And, uh, you know, I, after a while, you know, I just started thinking about it, and when they said $250 a week, Blue Cross Blue Seal, uh, all expenses <laughs> paid, and I, when they said that to my mother, she was like, oh, yeah, he can go on the road. He ain't doing nothing in school. He ain't doing nothing in school. So, yeah, go ahead and take him. Man, 17. Wow, that's, yeah. that's pretty cool, man. Yeah, so I worked all the way. You know, I stayed with the Dramatics 20 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of guys, you know, back then I could have got with uh, uh, Shaka Khan. I could have got with Natalie Cole, Bloodstone, uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Nose. But, you know, all that jumping around, bro, at the end of the day, I like that I stayed with one group because I was able to write a lot of their songs, end up publishing songs, and end up producing them and putting them on my label. You know, that's the kind of relationships I like to do. I don't like to just get in and get out and right. just be running around. They don't even know your name. You number, you number 18. Right. Instead of you know knowing your name. So that's that's why I, how I come about doing my thing, bro. They so the dramatics is not um. After the dramatics, man, is when I started hearing about it. I didn't, first of all, I love the dramatics. I had no clue that you was on all, all of these records and stuff uh, 
first thing I started hearing about is this uh, Snoop Dogg. So between the dramatics, what, how did you hook up? What, what happened between dramatics and and your uh, L.A. stint? Well, I did 20 years with dramatics and I couldn't take it no more, man. You know, and and they I've said this on interviews before, but we was just running up and down the highway getting high, really, and still doing some shows. You know, <laughs> still doing shows, turning them out, but it was going nowhere, really. And it, and and when I finally quit, because you got to remember. I was with the dramatics at the top of the game all the way till it fell all the way down. Mm -hmm. And even when we broke up for a minute mm -hmm. and then got back together. You know what I mean? So it was just <coughs> to me somebody had to do something man. and I you know, and I called myself quitting because they brought um David Ruffin Junior, his daddy had just died, and they brought mm -hmm. him to me to start teaching him the ropes and the music, you know. This lawyer uh told me to produce him and stuff. So I would take David on the road with the dramatics to get a moment of silence for his daddy and then we would bring the dramatics out. Well after a while they let him sing a couple songs to bring them out, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it caught on man and this this one girl caught David's ear in um, LA when, when we went out there and uh, I mean she called us back and was like, y'all gotta come back man, y'all need to come back, David made a good impression, you know? Ain't no sense in, you know, sticking around in Detroit. And it was true man and it was just time and I said, well you know what, I'm gonna quit. I'm going to quit. It's been 20 years. We ain't doing nothing. I done watched my money go from the highs to the lows. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it must be time to quit. So we uh, we went out there, and David would be playing Dr. Dre music all the time, and I didn't know that music. I was like, man, if you don't cut that mess off, man, mm -hmm. I'm trying to I quit the dramatics. I'm, you know, trying to get my head together, and you bumping girls getting slapped and all kind of stuff. You know, you Dre's music, man, you, you know, it's, it's so like you can visualize it too mm -hmm. and that's what I liked and uh, I went from not wanting to hear that to driving all the way to California and that's all I listened to was the chronic it flipped about I drove 17 hours one time and the tape just flipped and flipped and flipped and I really liked it because they had nice bass lines going on and stuff but they had samples it would be right. like that nothing but a G thing was a sample from you know right from that so uh, when we got to California uh, you know we went out one night and uh, Warren G was there and Snoop and David being young like them he ran out there and told him he was David Ruffin and naturally that's going to spark some ears and then he was like yeah I'm here with my uh, manager and bass player Tony Green he played with the Dramatics a lot so Warren Warren is a real good you know he uh, he's the kind of guy you can send out to scout some good stuff you know mm -hmm. so he came up to me and said hey man uh, I heard you play bass and I said yeah he said well, my brother need bass all the time, you know, you should call him. And he gave me Dre's number. We called him for a week. And then uh, finally, one, the next time he called us back, and uh, he said, can you come on down to the studio? And once he did that, and I walked in, and they had nothing but a G thing playing, but without the bass line. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, do you know this? And I said, well, I heard it. I can learn it right quick. He said, no, uh, I just would like to hear what you would play, and man, I, I tell you, easily I played like 20 different bass lines to the beat, man. He was like, oh, I gotta have you right now, man. Mm -hmm. I gotta have this right now. So <laughs> that that was the start of that. But what they didn't know is that I had already had gold records and stuff coming from the Dramatics, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, seem like I was so much older. You know what I mean? Right. But Snoop every day would be playing the Dramatics, man. And he'd be like, T Green, you don't know nothing about this when he closed the door <laughs> and get out. And I was like, what are these days, man? And then he came up playing Welcome Back Home, and I wrote that song for the Dramatics. And uh, and I was like, hold on, Snoop, let me see the cover. And I and I showed him, and he read the credits right then and saw my name. And he said, can you get, can we get the Dramatics here? I said, yeah. He said, can we call LJ? I said, I can call LJ right now. And he gave me the phone. I called LJ right then, man. And he was so happy to talk to LJ. He said, is this LJ Reynolds? And LJ said, yeah. He said, can you sing a little key to the world? <laughs> Mm, LJ, right there on the phone. And LJ was like, lock me, lock me, lock me, lock me up, baby. He said, oh, man, T, I got to help me. He said, well, I'm going to have Dr. Dre and T. Green hook you up, man, you know, hook the dramatics up. So the rest was history. We came in, and that was a beautiful day, man. Pam Greer, Huggy Bear, uh, man, Fred Williamson. I mean, everybody was there, man. In the and studio? Rerun. No, at the, uh, when we did the video. Oh, 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 okay. That Doggy Dog World video, you see uh, uh, that everybody's in it. So, in the studio, it was just the dramatics. I got a little mad at the dramatics because they didn't take it as serious as I wanted them to, and they came in kind of, 
Yeah. Okay, so um, you uh started doing you you were doing stuff the uh the tracks on for the dramatic song, a uh, Snoop song with the dramatics uh Doggy Dog World. Yeah. I how how did how they go, man? Well, that was uh and what happened was I made up the bass line. That's one of the baddest bass lines. I right made up there. the bass line and what happened is see Dre likes a lot of his stuff with the move. Mm -hmm. So I would make up a lot of bass lines that even some of would be played <laughs> on the move. And that was cool too, because I made up the bass line. I, mm -hmm. was, I was all good with that. I had no problems with it. And uh, you know, we did the Let Me Ride remix. Well, you know, I brought George Clinton into Death Row too. Mm -hmm. uh, I had told Dre when I first got with him, I said, oh yeah, I did stuff with George Clinton on that. So one day he remembered that. And I didn't know George was in the studio. And he said, didn't you say you know George Clinton? And I said, yeah, man, I know George real good. And I come and say, he in the other studio. Can you go get him? Looking at me like I might have been lying. Like, you know, I'm like, what? Let me go down there. I went in there and opened the door. And George looked at me. He said, I knew somebody had permission to be funking like that down there. <laughs> and I said, man, he loved you, man. You got to come on down and meet him, man. And I mean, that's the day he, he opened up with uh, Snoop's album. He, he did the, the intro on Snoop's album, man. Dude. Yeah, you know, he did like three, four things right there. Dre was just flabbergasted to have George, man. So, and I brought all the musicians from Detroit out there. It's all Detroit musicians <laughs> playing that stuff, mm -hmm. first of all. So, you know, people get it twisted. A lot of Detroiters won't call nobody. Mm -hmm. And it's a bad habit that goes on, too. They won't call, you know, they be knowing somebody and somebody's good, and they rather let the people bring in somebody else than to call your boy. I'm totally different than that. Because I knew bringing Ricky Rouse, Carl Butch Small, bringing all them people in was just going to make me look real good. So after I brought them in, Dre was like, T, you the man, for real. So that's how people should think more so than thinking, wow, he might take the love they got for me, you know, because they was crazy about me. Well, well uh, man, the, play some, give, can I have some of your other famous bass lines? I was 20 on this one. That's uh, why leave us alone by the fire special, right. man. Yeah. Wow, what, what else? Give me something else that I might know. Okay, how about... That's that endo song, right? That's uh, Gin and Juice. Oh, that's Gin and Juice? Yeah. When I came home that summer, man, I didn't have to buy drinks or nothing. I just go in the club. They'd be like, oh, man, get over here. <laughs> you know, I was like, Endo Smoke really opened it up, man. And that was just a favor back when Warren hooking me up. Mm -hmm. I remember he had a little budget. He was like, I ain't got much like my brother be paying you, but I said, Warren, you don't need nothing, man. What you need me to do? And that. That yeah. helped me. You exactly. know what I mean? And that's another thing too. Guys should take more chances on, you know, working with, with some of the younger people, man, because you get caught all up in your old thing and be all staled out, I'm you know? Because you, you never know what, what can happen. You'd be crazy. No, I ain't doing that. What if I said that? What if when, when uh, they were like, let me introduce you to uh, Warren, or what if when Warren came over and said, uh, my brother played bass all the time and I take the number and thought, man, I ain't into that rap. Right. No, we would, let me tell you, we wouldn't have those. I made a lines. killing in rap the the <laughs> first year more than the twenty years with the dramatic. So <laughs> you know, I, I'm just glad that I've I've always been one that you know will open up to new and fresh ideas, man. I ain't about trying to not think something might work or not. Give me a let me just do it. Now I do a lot of bass lines for guys, man. They call me, come to the studio, I'm in there. Just like I used to do with Ice Cube and DJ Quick and everybody else, I just run in there, put the bass line down, grab my money, and get on out. Did uh, and well, you just named those guys. Who are some of the other people that uh, you work with? Uh, we can hear you on the recordings and stuff. Well, like that. the uh, the Five Footers uh, was with Warren's crew, uh, the Five Footer crew, and the Twins. Both of them got nice albums that I'm playing on. The Poetic Justice uh, soundtrack.
Mm -hmm. And the uh, Jason Lyric soundtrack, you know, I produced two songs on the Above the Rim soundtrack. Oh, man, I didn't know all of that. Yeah, I produced two songs on there. And one of them is my uh, nephew gave me a cassette. And he was like, Uncle Tony, hey, man, would you just check my beats out on this cassette? And I mean, I already liked this stuff. Plus, I loved him as a nephew. And um, I took the cassette to California with me, and I started bumping it. And then when they told me, T, we're going to let you do two songs on the Bud the Rim. Then I said, you know what? There's one song on this cassette. I'm putting this on there. But I didn't let them know it was on cassette. So what I did was throw it on 24-track reel right quick. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't look like it was just a cassette. Mm -hmm. So the track was on track one and two on the reel. From the cassette? Yeah. <laughs> but the rapper put 20 other tracks on there. So, I mean, we really used up all of the reel. You know what I mean? Right. And Lord G, he was from here. That was the guy, the artist. And uh, I mean that turned out great. I mean that that soundtrack. Well, that was just Dre giving me back some, you know, like thanking me, giving me a chance to to get into the real money of the other thing by producing two tracks like that. Mm -hmm. That was like the biggest soundtrack ever in the in the rap world. Yeah, man. Um, so so uh, what you up to nowadays? What you been doing? I'm always cutting, man. I got two thousand songs, two hundred masters, reel to reels, two hundred reel to reels that we going through taking songs off, putting them on hard drive, loading them up because I'm going to launch an uh, iTunes label with all of that music from the past because there's no such thing as music getting old. My stuff was mixed and mastered in expensive studios, so they still sound great today, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, you you got a market. There's people out there that love this, the old stuff from the death row days. I got tons of that kind of music. I got the dramatics, four or five songs unreleased on them, two or three songs unreleased on Keith Washington. I mean, I got I got a vault for real, bro. I got a real good vault. And, and we can expect to hear that coming yeah, soon. You're going to be here. As a matter of fact, I got one project out called Eye of the Storm, but I didn't put it out for sale. So if you see me and I got some copies, I, you know, I give them up. But I'm not into selling it right now because I'm more into pushing the records now to the uh, movie industry that's coming. I mean, it's a lot of movie people here. And I'm glad, you know, they, they're getting ready to stop everybody from doing covers. Uh, arts, beats, and eats, and stuff like that. You know, I'm just glad my band. All we do is original stuff. What's the name of your band? Roadwork. T Money Green's Roadwork. Okay, speaking of uh, Roadwork, dude, you got like what, like eight nominations for the Detroit yeah, Music Awards? Yeah, we got six this year, and uh, I won. I won a couple last year, and I won a couple in uh, 2008. And uh, you know what I like about the Detroit Music, you know, is that it's the uh, the Music Awards. It's like the real deal. I mean, it's as close to the Grammys you can get. You know, everybody right, trying to I mean, everybody trying to do Detroit, them, right? But this is the real deal, and they roll out the red carpet, and they be just all your peers there. Man, you know what I mean? I'm and, more interested in the Detroit Music Awards than I am in the Grammys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, yeah, but I'm gonna tell you something. It's the same. A few of the same people that's on the Grammy board mm -hmm. is, is on the Detroit Music Awards. I'm still board. trying to figure out how does Justin Bieber and Esperanza Spalding end up in the same category? Yeah, that's, that's, that blew my mind. Yeah, that's that would common. be horrible to me. And uh, Esperanza, I mean, she's a, a man. She's the bomb. Right. Man. She's a sweet. Song. I Justin credit Bieber. your generation, man, for doing that because when I was coming along, we were at the mercy of record companies. Yeah. You know, you come in there with a talent, and they just figure out a way to extract. Right. A profit out of what you do. Right. Y'all said, uh uh, I'm gonna do what I want. Yeah. You didn't compromise yourself. <laughs> no. And when they didn't follow you, y'all built your own stuff. Yeah, we would have never sure. thought or conceived to do that. They wouldn't even put our names on record. Right, yeah. <laughs> But, um, I mean, that was a big thing. That's like when Ray Charles was talking about, can I own my master? That was unheard right, of. Right, yeah, yeah, that's unheard of. And, uh, you know, it was funny. When I got to death row, the masters would be laying all on the floor. I mean, I'm like, you know, nothing but a G thing is sitting right by the door that yeah. somebody can pick up and walk out uh. with them. And I was like, Dre, man, y'all got to stop doing your masters like this. So I ended up having to have them, have them built a shelf, and we started putting the, mm -hmm. the reels on there, you know. I started getting a little hated on though by the powers that be like Suge Knight and stuff only because people would say stuff like this from the Interscope. Boy, Suge, if you had two more people like T. Green, man, this would be a real, you know, you can't, mm -hmm. I'd be like, uh, don't say that, please don't say that. <laughs> Cause you know, people find, find ways to hate on that as opposed to saying, mm -hmm. well, yeah, he did bring George Clinton, he did bring the dramatics, he mm -hmm. did bring all these musicians, that's what's selling the music. Right. But instead, it's like, man, he ain't from he ain't from California. Right. Well, no, I wasn't. But you would think I am. I got just as many friends in Cali as I got here. 
Okay. And everybody know me for what I do musically out there, just like here. So, you know, it's a, Detroit. I mean, we on a whole different vibe than that. Right, no Detroit you Music Awards. We War. come in trying to do our thing. So the Detroit Music Awards coming up next Friday. You know, I've been running around getting my little outfits. It's the only time I let my hair grow on the hair. So when I go to the barber, he can make it all even. <laughs> you know, it's. I mean, I be serious with it, man. You know what I mean? Because it's just like going to the, if it was if you had nominated for the Grammy. And the thing is, say say I don't win. Mm hmm. I mean, you hear your name all night in the nominations. I mean, that's a that's winner cool. right there, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. That's just as much a winner. But I've been able to sneak a few of them out every now and then, so I'm really good about that. I'm really happy about that. Yeah, any other accolades we got besides the Detroit Music Awards? You got the Grammys yet? <laughs> well, well, as a matter of fact, well, I just put it like this. They got a Grammy for Jen and Juice, so to me, that's my Grammy, too. All right. You know, a lot of I'm going to tell you, uh, I don't have... As many of the plaques as I should have that I'm on, man, but that's just how people started doing, holding back on giving you that stuff. But it don't matter because when you go to the records, you see my name on the credits. It's just as good. It's just as good. And accolades, yeah, so we done, we've we won MTV Movie Awards, MTV Awards, and all that stuff was it with me and the yep, audience yeah. with them and playing bass on the stuff, you know what I mean? Dude. So, uh, yeah, them the accolades. But the, but the real accolades is being able to play. I probably even play bass on over a, a few hundred joints easy and real big things like we did Shaquille O'Neal, Biological Father, which the G-Funk version is out cold, Warren G, we did that. And uh, I'm going to tell you what I just decided to do. I'm putting the uh, all the guys that was doing that music back then, mm -hmm. I'm calling the truce with a couple of them that we been hating on each other. And because right now I'm bringing the same musicians that did all of that music and we're going to cut some stuff right now, man. And I'm going to tell you, we the ones did that music and, and you know when I'm I'm around Snoop, when Snoop come to town I see him, so I'm just gonna hand him a CD when he get here of us as them same guys doing that music and he gonna be, I know we about to get some more money. Dude, yeah, because that, that that out of all the rappers he's got that longevity. Yeah, I yeah. think that's gonna never die. Yeah, no matter yeah, what. Yeah, he. yeah, he gonna because he you know why? It's because <clears throat> he take the different chances that you got to take. People get set in their ways, and then that's when you don't see the money. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. Every time you turn around, he doing something different. Yeah. Well, man, uh, I ain't want to keep you. I mean, I, I do want to keep you to talk all day, but but I know you got things to do, places to go, people yeah, to see. Yeah, but I man. came here to see y'all, man. Get a few things out of the. Get a few things out of the way, and you know, the next time I like to come back and get with the round table. The round table's cool, but a lot of those guys I just don't know, and I, you know, you know, some I people feel, me. you know, some people. Yeah, I'm just not one to feel that to comfortable be. around a lot of people that I don't know. So yeah, that's okay. You know what I mean? And it ain't, and, it, and I know that ain't nothing wrong with it, cause you know, you got people that love you for what you do, and then you got people that hate you for what you do. So I do what I do, and, and I mean, I don't know which one a person is. So it's just best. So that's why I came in here like this with you today, no ego tripping or nothing. Cause I like all of the different interviews that's been going on, you know. Yeah. But I know they throw that legendary term out there so easy that. Mm -mm, like, you got gotta you gotta earn that. Else. I'm like I gotta be called something else then. If he legendary, then wow. <laughs> I mean, then what you know? What is these 99 different uh, baselines and sessions I didn't create? Cause I ain't I ain't right. did much at all on the local set. When I came back, and people, this is why I don't go to jam sessions. It's because I don't know no songs. Mm -hmm. I know the dramatics, right. or I know what I made up for snooping them, but I don't know songs. Man. Right, they gotta play some that you know, right. and they ain't gonna know that. Yeah, right. I, so, I know exactly so how you feel. So when we get up and groove, you know, I start a groove off of something, and we do something like that. But for the most part, yeah, I don't know songs, bro. Right. I never had to play them. <laughs> just a dramatic song right. for 20 you, years, you, and then, just, like I said, all this stuff with, with snooping them that we did. Hey, you know, I th just thought about that. This dude. Didn't have to play covers. He, he, they play, they covering your stuff. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I go to see the singing groups. They singing all the dramatic songs and you know songs that I wrote and Why Leave Us Alone, the Fire Special. I mean, for a long time it was definitely different bands doing that. I would go to a club and hear that. Mm -hmm. And I go to a club and I might hear somebody doing Doggy Dog World or Jenny Juice. And the funny thing about Jenny Juice was, I had just took my bass out the the, the case when Dre had the beat going. And I was like, oh man, I'm feeling that. And then when I started this. And he was like, he was like, that's it, man. 
<laughs> and I said, well, hold on, okay, cool, let me tune up. He said, no, don't tune I said, Troy, come on, you got to tune up, man. I just took it out the case. I'm just fun. He said, man, don't touch it, man. Mm -hmm. So that bass line is all out of tune. <laughs> and it just showed me then, too, man, that it ain't no right and wrong way for music. Right. My stepfather was hard on me for playing upside down because he's he's a player. And he the first thing he seen me when I was playing upside down, he was like, because I was playing his bass, he was like, okay, you playing my bass, oh, man, you know, but you're going to have to flip it over because you got it upside down. Mm -hmm. But by then, I knew two, three songs, man. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I can't flip it over now. That so, is amazing. That so we got right into it. a horrible thing. I mean, it got to where I just quit listening to him. He couldn't say nothing to me as far as music was concerned because we was just on a whole different page. And it took my uncle, who was a music master, to tell him, there's no right and wrong way to play, Will. I mean, you got to leave him alone. Right, because, mm -hmm. I mean, you think about it. A lot of these songs, uh, which I enjoy, got chops, 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 chops. But if you ask somebody how they heard it, they, they no, nah, I ain't heard that. <laughs> right, I, right. Or, or if you seen that bass line, I don't know what that is, right. but with your bass line, yeah. you seen them? Yeah, they're pretty memorable. It, they, they, and they, they turned me up loud, too. I mean, sometimes, because uh, that endo smoke, I was like, Warren, can you turn me down a little bit in the mix? He was like, nah, T, I like it. <laughs> you know, I was like, man, y'all put me louder and louder. And then, uh, you know, that guy, who is the, the guy that, uh, he comes on HBO, and he has it, oh, Joe Muir, uh, oh, Bill Maher, Bill Maher, he had all the rappers on the round table one time, right, and he was like, so what is hip-hop, and everybody was like, well, hip-hop is hip-hop, you know, nobody could really answer, mm -hmm. but Bill Maher said, hip-hop got smart when it added a bass line, and I knew he was talking about me, because that's all the people he had around the table, right, mm -hmm. And the different bass lines that was going on. I mean, I knew what he was talking about. He said he got smart when he added bass line. Because all that sampling was one thing. But when you got somebody creating bass lines, it's, it's a whole... The yeah, very first, you, you created the very some first bass line I did for Dre, they had Woman's Gotta Have It bass line. You know, Bobby Womack. Uh -huh. and, uh, but they couldn't get the clearance on this song. And it was... The song was a real... The title was horrible. I don't want to get bleeped out but it was on the Poetic Justice soundtrack with the Dog Pound. Mm -hmm. And uh, they couldn't use the woman's gotta have it. And even though we knew Bobby Womack good, man, me and David Ruffin was always asking Bobby, well, look, they willing to pay 50000 for it. He's like, man, I ain't write that song for that. I wrote that for my mama, man. I don't want nobody to be. But what we found out later is he didn't have the rights no more. And, you know, right. that's why he was, because anybody would have jumped on the money. They went all the way up to like, Seventy-five thousand to use, mm -hmm. but he didn't do it. So Dre was just all bent out of shape, and the and the, uh, the uh, singleton was there, and everybody and they couldn't figure out nothing else. And I said, "Well, Dre, just put the bass." I said, "Put the beat on without the bass line, uh, without that bass line." And he put the beat on. And <coughs> two seconds later, I said, "I said," and that's all I did. And I'm gonna tell you something, man. You'd have thought I played. A thousand licks, man. They was running around that crazy. That's it, T. That's it. Mm -hmm. But every one of Dre's beats, man, the moment I hear it, and that's what I specialize in. You play a drum beat, mm -hmm. I'm going to make a bass line that's going to sit. Not just me play a bass part. Mm -hmm. I'm, I like to feel like I'm creating that song. And that's why it starts from just me and the drums first. Mm -hmm. You know, because then I know I've done, you know, my part in, in creating that. Now, I might not have got the royalties that I probably should have got, but... Like I said, I came broke from the dramatics. When he when he gave me the gig, I got ready to say, when he said, well, how much is it going to take? I got ready to say, $50 every time we get together. Mm -hmm. If he would have found, <laughs> I would have thought he was it was too, too high. I would have been like, well, 30 <laughs> Instead, he was like, well, I can start you off with $700 a week right now. And I was like, doing what? He said, just making up baseline. Man, I was like, how long will it last? <laughs> but it went from that to writing enormous shit. I mean, I could do whatever I want to do after that, because I put the band together for, you know, it's Saturday Night Live. Did you ever see Snoop on Saturday Night Live? That's me playing on there. Mm -hmm. We did the, uh, the Gin and Juice remix, which uh, was a whole lot more bass than the Gin and Juice remix. But I, I mean, just saving the day was something that I really enjoyed doing for a lot of people making up bass lines. And it was some hard stuff, like Robbie Robinson from the band, the group called The Band, is an old, mm -hmm. he's an old legendary Willie Nelson type of guy well he wanted me to play because he had been listening to some bass from the death row stuff and uh and they wanted me to play and I back then I would go in and do a session and be finished like in 20 minutes and getting the check man his stuff was so hard man I mean because he wanted me to create the just the 
the real feel for it. And I mean, I ended up squeezing out two nice ones, man, that, uh, and, the, you know, just getting paid for doing what you like to do is just mm -hmm. something that I think is fantastic. Well, well, look, is it like, is it a central location where we can check out, you know, your body of work? You got like a website or something like that? Well, I know on this site called uh, thedigitalvision.com, mm -hmm. they got a listing. I mean, you see the pictures of a whole bunch of albums that you know I'm on. Mm -hmm. But other than that, the YouTube, you know, you got to understand, I come from the era where we would pay a promotion man to go to Chicago to push our records. Mm -hmm. So, and then he called you from Dearborn, really telling you, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's kicking here, man. I'm in Chicago and it's kicking. <laughs> you be like, you in Chicago, that sound like you. I just heard the same noise I heard <laughs> around us. But, I mean, so I'm enjoying the fact that you have the internet and you got YouTube, and you got ways to put your music out there and promote. So that's why I just and promote. And you know what? It's really working, man. I got a nice fan base out here. What, what your YouTube? What's your, You got well, a YouTube channel? Well, I got a yeah. I got a um, uh, T Money Green Entertainment YouTube channel. Okay, so we can uh, catch some of your yeah, stuff you there. Yeah, you can find a bunch of stuff on there. Yeah, but overall, I I usually throw everything on YouTube, and it's T Money Green or Tony Green. Or, you know what I mean? I'm, and I always tag it, so if if you pull up Tony Green and the T Money Green stuff will pull up too, you know. Okay, and um, you don't have a website, but we can also uh, kick it with you on Facebook. With, Facebook, what's your name? Green, uh, Edward Tony Green on Facebook. If you just put Tony Green in there, the, the picture will come up. If you know who I am, then you'll see that. Right. Uh, yeah, I, right. I really enjoy those mediums of uh, being able to promote and push your stuff, man. Wendy's good with doing her stuff like that too. I, I see a lot of Wendy stuff on there. I really like it. Uh, who is Wendy? Wendy Hay. Oh, uh, oh, oh, Wendy, Gwen oh, Hayes. Oh, Wendy. We call her yeah. Wendy before. Okay. Uh, before she's using Gwen a lot now. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I know who that she is. She's a sweetheart. Yeah. We, another Detroit based player. Yeah, and uh, Emily Rogers. Y'all got to get Emily in here, man. Oh, yeah. Yo, y'all and Emily already. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, man. I just ain't. I just ain't posted it yet. Oh, okay. Oh, cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, they was here together. Oh, good. And um. Uh, Emily brought me back out of retirement. When I came back, I was just in the studio and stuff. And one day she was like, "T, you want to put something together and open up for my uh, my band?" And I was like, "Emily, come on, you know I ain't played no shows in a while." And I was like, "You serious?" And she was like, "Yeah, throw something together." So I threw a three piece together, me, Bubby Webb, and uh, Greg Dokes, mm. and we did like a half an hour. And I had the bug ever since then. I was like, oh, man, I got to do more of these things. Well, she gave you some mad props in her interview. So, uh, Tony, you check it out. And, and everybody else check out uh, Emily's interview upcoming. You can all you can catch all of them on DetroitBassPlayers.com and stuff. They all consolidated. But, you know, before I let you go, man, um, your name came up on a lot of uh, these interviews. Your name came up in the Lamar interview. Your name came up in the uh, I heard Emily it. interview. I heard it in the David one. Yeah, it came up in the David Winans interview. So you got like an influence on uh, a lot of people and everything. Who are some of the bass players that, that you like? You know, yeah. throw some names that they Well, I'm going to tell you, like I said, it started with Reggie Mc McBride, man, at Mumford, right? Mm -hmm. And by the time I met Reggie and he came and heard me play, and I was like, Reggie, it's because of you I'm playing like that. He's like, man, you crazy. Don't even be trying to geek me up like that. I say, for real, man. He was like, no, nah, you playing too good. He didn't want to believe me. Mm -hmm. But that was somebody I was really crazy about. Mm -hmm. But my other idol was uh, Eddie Watkins, fast Eddie Watkins. Didn't nobody know who Eddie Watkins was. I and still don't. I kept saying Eddie's name, and then Detroit bass players posted him. And he kicking everybody's butt. They was like, oh, I see what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Eddie Watkins is a monster, man. He had a group called legacy back in the day and I mean he could sing and play his butt off but he's an excellent player he's close to Jameson as anybody ever was because I mean nobody is close to Jameson right because even the guys that's real good with the chop overplay Jameson you know his overplaying is like my overplaying in the rap stuff it fit mm -hmm. but you know you get some other players man they just you can't even hear they playing Misty you know <laughs> or what's it all about the guy yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, man, I gotta go. I, you know, I ain't, can't even go out and hear these guys no more, man. It just and then Ralph, I've been wanting to get on his show. He he won't put me on his show, but he put on everybody else on his show. And that's one and of your he, favorite guys. Though? He, that's well, he used to, look. He was on the Mahavishnu album. Mm -hmm. One album that he took a bass on, and that was playing. a monster. 
Any amount of claim. Yeah, that was it. And I had to learn that <laughs> note for note. Now, I forgot it over the years now. But that was a special bass line. I mean, that made me say, Ralph, when he wear the bass pimp shirt, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, he can wear it. Mm -hmm. But then when I go down to see him sometimes, he's like, uh, take that shirt off, bro. Because <laughs> he can show up play, man, but he clown a lot, man. I yeah, think he, he should just show him what he can really do, man. Right. And laying in the cut. But Lamont is a serious brother, man. He was serious in Brainstorm. Mm -hmm. I just yeah, always yeah, yeah. liked his stuff. And I like the fact that he, he wrote and, and made a song. And, and it hit for him, you know what I mean? But that's what I mean. All of these guys got the talent to write songs, man, but I, I'm wondering when they're going to jump on that bandwagon because if you, at the end of the day, to me, like I've been with ASCAP 35 years now, mm -hmm. and I've been, they've been sending me a check for that long now. I mean, to me, that's all it's really about, man, and these different companies sending money now and the death row. I mean, you got to get the most you can get out of it because if it's just playing, before you know it, arthritis going to kick in. I ain't half as good as I was when I was 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. But I still know where to play and know where to put stuff at. You know what I mean? A little bit wiser. Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So therefore, it just show you that it ain't all about how much stuff you can do because, I mean, in a minute you won't be able to do it. I look at my dad who's like one of the greatest bass players around. 80 years old, his chops as slow as I don't know what now. I mean, it's a lot slower. He's still good. I wish my dad would have wrote a lot more songs, you know, or wrote some songs. And then, you know, he wouldn't still be even running around gigging or trying to go to different places. And, you know, now they look at the older guys like, you know, he still can go to Baker's every now and then. I mean, I, I used to go to Baker's and watch him from seven years old on. I mean, you know in the heyday man so I hate to see him not be able to do it but then it's a reflection I look at him and say well, wow I'm 55 I'll be 80 one day mm -hmm. the difference of my 80 will be is that it'll be money coming in from songwriting and stuff and all these people that don't have talent sampling our music mm -hmm. yeah I love that they sample yeah, yeah that's uh, another check yeah. in the mail right yeah and it's a couple of them because that but like a, what was that, um, uh, the George Clinton song that I did on the Aqua Boogie album, you know, it was it, called it, One of Those Funky <laughs> Things. What amazed me, some of these cats, uh, forget their own songs that, that yeah, kills me. so many at this point <laughs> now. But on the, um, One of Those Funky <clears throat> Things was the song on the Motor Booty album. Mm -hmm. with the big bird you know coming over yeah. and uh that song mm -hmm. they took a little piece of this sample that go um oh. just that little bit right there been on master p's album the rough riders album i mean like seven different hip-hop artists sampled that little lick mm -hmm. and that's always my name is connected to it you know uh, uh the game did me and Ron Banks, California Sunshine. He called it Cali Sunshine. I mean, there it is again. I mean, I like that they sample our stuff. So I just think everybody should write more stuff uh -huh. and get it out there like that. You never know who gonna like that stuff. I know, man. And then don't even worry about who. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, who just, cares? Do, just do you. Hey, While He Was Alone was the biggest dance record. I could not dance on it at all. Mm -hmm. I could not dance. I was like, this ain't gonna never make it as a dance record. Just because I couldn't dance on it don't mean nothing. All I could dance on was George Clinton's music back then. Right. As soon as the George Clinton beat hit, boy, you can dance. You mm -hmm. can do all your crazy stuff with <laughs> that. But while he was alone, I could not find the one to dance with. My own bass line. I'm like, how do you dance to a bass line like that, man? <laughs> People used to do all kind of disco dancing on there, man. All right, man. Well, like I said... Uh... Well, I got a little hurt when all the bass players showed up and didn't call T. Green. Oh, you talking about the photo shoot? Yeah, I thought that was like, I mean, me and my dad has been holding it down in Detroit bass players forever, man, and, and, and bringing up and helping other bass players get there, and soon they couldn't wait to do a photo shoot without me. So now I'm getting ready to do my own with two other bass players. I ain't going to even say who they is, <laughs> but them is going to be there. They're going to be like, oh, okay, I get the message. But, but uh... We're getting ready to propose another photo shoot. Yeah. I think you have to do it while it's warm outside, too. Yeah, well, tell them to get, tell them don't leave me out this time. Right. I, I, I don't think they left you out. What I think happened was, uh, they just, you know, it, it was word of mouth. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not a avid 
follow of the Detroit bass players yeah, page. Yeah, right. Although I have, you know, I, I click on it from time to time and peek in and see mm -hmm. some stuff. Right. You know, but, uh, yeah, it wasn't like I was checking at that time and then they did it. Right. And I called Kerry. I was like, man, that's horrible, man. He's like, T, we had it on the site. Yeah, but, you know, post it on my site then. You're going to be posting other junk on there I don't want, you know what I mean? <laughs> it, got bigger than they, it, got, it got bigger than they ever thought it was going to get. Yeah. They thought it was just going to be a couple of guys getting together, shooting information back and forth. Yeah, a handful got, of guys. Right. That's almost some of the guys. Man. Yeah, man, that's what I mean. Yeah, that was kind of crazy. Well, but, well, man, keep, but keep chiming in, though, and if, if, if you can, uh, Hit us on uh, what they call DetroitBassPlayers dot com, right. and and um, leave us some valuable information because the DetroitBassPlayers dot com is more like a, a forum type thing, and uh, I'm sure you can educate a lot of us uh, bass players that need to know the ins and out of the business. You I know what I'm saying? Definitely stop you from making the mistakes I made. You know, if nothing else, you know mm -hmm. that that in itself is important. Right. Because a lot of people make the same mistakes that a guy like me had made. Back when I was 20, 21, 22, 23, you know, that you learn over the years. I mean, and like I say, I've been playing now 41 years. I've been in the in the business 41 years. I mean, I, I could kind of help. Yeah, well, That's why I ran a, a little thing on my page. I said BMI or ASCAP. And all, all right. different people was putting who they were with, you know. Uh -huh. And I wasn't asking for no particular reason. It just mm -hmm. I just wanted to see how many people were well, aware that I mean you should be with one of them right. if you're doing music, you know what I mean? So, yeah. uh, somebody said something about AARP. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, I'm about that age. Yeah. <laughs> I am that age. <laughs> Big man, well, we ain't want to keep you, uh, we just wanted to talk to you, let you tell us a little bit about the Tony Green, T-Money Green, Detroit bass player story. It's all about Detroit, man, and all around, I'm going to tell you, everywhere I go, if it's a camp blowing up, if it's like Usher, if he got something hot out, trust me, there's somebody from Detroit is in there. You know, R. Kelly got two brothers from Detroit with him. You know what I mean? If, wherever it's a powerful camp that's making money, you're going to have some Detroit players on there. So That is so true, man. We, we, we be representing. Yeah, yes, we do. All right, so uh, just play us something, man, so we can uh, let you go, brother. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. T. Green, Detroit bass player. For you to tell you us, doing what you're doing, man. Everybody deserves a shot. I'm getting, I'm from the, the the big one to the small. There you go. Everybody, mm -hmm. what they say, George said, everybody deserve a little light under the sun. Mm -hmm. It's for real, man. I mean, because we do put it in, and they hate on hate on the city. So it ain't the players. It's just the fact that they try to hate on the city mm -hmm. so much. Right. But the players doing the right thing. The only thing you might be doing wrong is staying in Detroit. You know, you might need to just run out somewhere else right quick and grab some loot mm. and then come on back because it's, it's out there for you. I mean, everybody could probably find work somewhere else because mm. it ain't going to happen right now, right here in Detroit, especially the way it's all clawing. Right. Everybody clawing at it, you know, clawing at it. Uh, but, uh, yep, just, hey, you know, it's all about collaborations, man. We all collaborate. That's why I'm here with you collaborating right now, bro. And right. that's why you're going to the Music Awards with me next week, right? Oh, man. Y'all yeah, yeah. here, now. Bring the camera. Y'all here. Camera. Bring the camera. <laughs> you're going to have a lot of fun with them people there, man. It's going to be nice. Okay. All right. That's All right. cool. I will right. get the... Give me some more batteries, man. <laughs> yeah, get some get some Duracell for that night, man. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Troy bass player, Mr. Tony Gray. Yeah.